on today's story beat to sing the way you know you can or that you, that makes you feel good about it you know you try to just keep yourself as prepared as possible for the opportunity that will come along this is story beat with steve cute a podcast for the creative mind story beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire so join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, the powerhouse singer and actress Karen Mason, has starred on Broadway, off Broadway, on screen, and in recordings. Karen is a 13-time Mac Award winner, has won the Mac Award for Major Female Vocalist of the Year six consecutive years. She was the recipient of the 2019 Mac Lifetime Achievement Award, and Karen also won the 2006 Nightlife Award for Major Female Vocalist and has three Bistro Awards. On stage, Karen has played Madame Giry in the North American premiere of Love Never Dies, Andrew Lloyd Webber's sequel to The Phantom of the Opera. Karen's Broadway roles include the Queen of Hearts in Wonderland, Tanya in Mamma Mia, for which she received a Drama Desk nomination for Best Actress, Norman Desmond in Sunset Boulevard, Velma Von Tussel in Hairspray, Monotony singer Mazeppa in Jerome Robbins' Broadway, Rosalie in Carnival, and featured roles in Torch Song Trilogy and Play Me a Country Song. Karen won the Outer Critic Circle Award for her performance in And the World Goes Round and starred off-Broadway in her own show, Karen Mason Sings Broadway, Beatles, and Brian. Karen starred in the first national tour of A Christmas Story as Miss Shields, and regionally she's been seen in White Christmas, Side by Side by Sondheim, Gypsy, and Company, among others. Karen also starred in the one-woman musical about Dorothy Parker, You Might As Well Live. Karen has given concerts all around the world and is headlined at Carnegie Hall, the Kennedy Center, Lincoln Center, Feinstein's at the Regency, Rainbow and Stars, the Algonquin, and numerous others. She's shared stages with Michael Feinstein, Jerry Herman, Cheetah Rivera, Luciano Pavarotti, Rosemary Clooney, Liza Minnelli, and John Kander and Fred Ebb, among many more. Her highly acclaimed recordings include her newest single, It's About Time, her Mac award-winning Right Here, Right Now, and the Mac award-winning When the Sun Comes Out. Karen has also been featured on various cast and soundtrack recordings. On TV, Karen's been in shows like Law and & Order SVU and on film in Sleeping Dogs Lie and A Chorus Line. For more, please visit karenmason.com. So for all those reasons and many more, <laughs> It's a deep honor and a real privilege for me to welcome the exceptionally talented Karen Mason to Story Beat today. Karen, welcome to the show. Thanks, Steve. Boy, after hearing all of that, I'm a little tired. <laughs> you, you think you're tired? You should try it from my side. <laughs> so let's go back in time. Let's go back into your history. Um, obviously, you've been um, at this thing on stage for quite some time. Um, when did the stage bug first hit you? At what age were you? Were you a little girl? Well, I was I was younger. I, you know, I, my sister, my older sister, and I have a sister who's four years older than I. And when we were younger, um, she wanted to do uh, plays and musicals for our family. So I, she created it. She was the director, and may I say, she was the star, <laughs> and I was the townsperson who did everything else. But I knew that I really loved it or else I wouldn't have put up with being the townsperson for so many years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just, we always had music around the house. My mom was, uh, when she was younger, was being trained as a concert pianist. And so she loved having music on. And the second she woke up, there was music in the house, whether she was playing it or you know, on the, the hi-fi. You were surrounded by music at all times. Surrounded by music. and. One of my mother's favorite was uh, Frank Sinatra. So, you know, I had great vocalists to listen to. Even mm -hmm. if I wasn't totally paying attention, it seeped in. 
and between that and and just being a middle child, you know, who needed all that attention, show business seemed like a perfect fit. <laughs> so I, uh, you know, I, I did a lot of shows in not so much. I did a couple of shows in high school. It, it was really it really kicked in for me in college. And, and were you uh, extroverted as a kid? Were you a, a performer? I mean, did you want to be performing for people? I um I wanted attention, sure. I was kind of a, a I was a fat kid. Huh. When my younger sister came along, I listen, being a fat kid is no novelty, but uh mine was because I was eating out of frustration man this is like years of therapy eating out of frustration <laughs> because my my little sister came along and i was the middle child i wanted to be the baby again <laughs> and so i uh i started like eating 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 and um you know it was my way of controlling things i was a little fat kid who was always dealing with her weight mm -hmm. And so I think it was, you know, when when singing, I started to get attention for singing. At what it age? Was, well, uh, you know, doing being the townsperson in Kathy's shows, which, by the way, were called Fourth of July specials. Oh, you know. the specials! Yeah. I know they were specials. They came with <laughs> treats, by the way. Ooh. Yeah, I know a cake, a Fourth of July cake. Um, but you know, I I loved that. Um, my sister and I were always singing in the back of the car whenever we were going somewhere, just always singing around. I don't think until high school, um, I, you know, I, we, it was part of who I was, but I don't think it was really until high school and when it started to feel like, I, I can tell you the exact moment. Mm. I, I uh, went to an all girls Catholic high school and so you have to find your own date for prom. And for a kid who was kind of a, you know, a nerd, a dork, you know, backward, uh, I didn't quite know how to do this. So I went to the, I had heard that the, uh, the boys school was uh, auditioning for their musical. And so I went over and auditioned and thought this would be a great way to meet, uh, you know, a boy to take to prom. And, uh, I got cast as a townsperson. See this, you know, you see that consistency in my life. <laughs> got cast as a townsperson in Annie Get Your Gun. Right. I had one line. Um, I can tell you that line right now. <laughs> it's a matter of fact. What was it? I had lunch with him yesterday. How did you know? <laughs> was my line. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and um, <laughs> uh, but the second I was on that stage, uh, I had never experienced that kind of peace isn't the right word. It, it was a combination of peace and excitement and being, it was right. It, it was, it felt like home to you. Yeah, it was, it felt like home. It was the correct place to be. And I was not scared of it. I was not overwhelmed except for the overwhelming feeling of, wow, this is where I should be. And I think at that moment is when I thought, yeah, this is, this feels like the correct um, place to, to move forward in so my life. So from that, from that place, from that day on, this was something that you had in your blood system. And yeah. I assume to this day, you've not been able to get out. Just, just... No, listen, they can't get rid of me. They keep trying and, <laughs> you know, but no, I, I, I love, well, I don't I'm, like. I'm, I'm glad they failed. <laughs> Well, thank you. You know, it's it. I love the performing part of it. I love the rehearsal. I love the creating. Um, it's just the business part of it that, you know, is is the toughest part, I think, for anybody in the business. But, um, uh, you know, well, you I, clearly have the chops. I mean, you've got a, a really big voice and you uh, clearly have great ta acting talent as well. So that well, thank you. It, it, it's not you know, it's not just one thing or another. It's a complete package. <laughs> who who did you look up to in those days? Who did you look to and say, you know what, that career is something like I want to have a career like so and so? Well, it's funny. I never thought in terms of mm, the word career to me feels like uh, it, it's when you you know it feels like a retrospect. Mm -hmm. You know that you look back on someone's career, mm -hmm. the you know from beginning to end. 
who I really admired for what they were doing was Judy Garland. Mm. I mean, that, and Barbara Streisand. Uh, these are the singers that I listened to that somehow spoke to my heart. The other one was John Gary, who, you know, is not necessarily a name that most people know, but I, um, oh, I just loved listening to him mm. and how he phrased a song. And, and it just, uh, those are the ones who spoke to my heart. So that's what I wanted more of. I wanted more of that. Uh, to listen to them and be able to do what they did to to um, speak through music. Early on, you were already thinking about phraseology and interpretation of words within the context of a song. That's what without like. yeah, without really um, you know like um, without really saying what that was. Yeah, that was important to me. The storytelling aspect of it. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. was really important to me. And, you know, I've thought about this a lot because when, when I first started, I loved ballads a lot. And I think it's, it was kind of my way of, of feeling um, less alone about those feelings of being alone. <laughs> Does that make sense? A, a little bit. It, it, yeah. It, it was, was it sort of like a solace or a company to you? It was company. Company. Yeah. To feel like other people were, that I wasn't the only one going through the heartache of breaking up with somebody or not finding somebody or, you know, whatever it was. And it was that feeling of, I'm telling you, I'm able to open up through music mm -hmm. to tell you something that's in my heart. And you're not judging me or telling me I shouldn't have those feelings. In a way, you're saying, yeah, I felt that too. Mm, well, that's what the power of songs, isn't it? The, the, oh, it can yeah. draw you right in and it's all emotion and not necessarily intellect at all. And right. it, it really it touches you in your heart and in your soul. D did you then go to, when you were in college, did you train? Did you, were you in the theater? Well... Kind of. I had, my parents were convinced, um, uh, my mother more so than my father, that I should have something to fall back on, which, you know, to anybody who's ever been told that, that sounds like uh, you're going to be a failure. <laughs> <laughs> and we just want to prepare you for it. So I... Well, you know what the truth is? <laughs> Most people that go down the road you went down don't succeed. The, right. The overwhelming majority don't. So you, it takes a certain something special. Yeah. I, yeah. But you know what? How do you know that until the very you, end? You don't. And if it's in your, if it's, you're passionate about it and it's in your blood, you have to do it. Right. Right. There were no other choices for me. I, there's nothing else that seemed really interesting. I mean, even though I started out in college doing, uh, you know, I started out in, in biology. I, I thought, okay, well, that's interesting. I really like that. I started, then I switched to math. I mean, I was like this revolving door of, of majors in, in college. Mm -hmm. um, and always I would hit a wall of, eh, this just doesn't interest me. I, I'm not really, I don't care that, you know, about Calc 3. So um, I would. I, I know. I know almost no one who does, <laughs> except for those people who love Calc three. And thank God for them. <laughs> <laughs> but it was. I was always doing community theater. You know, that was where my joy was. I I, I was in college and I was screwing it up royally, but boy was I great in community theater and couldn't <laughs> wait to be doing it. And so. You know, I should have listened a little bit more. Um, I should have listened more strongly to my heart. And instead, I, I tried to give my parents what they wanted, but it just wasn't right for me. And so basically, I, I, I kind of screwed up college. I went for four and a half years and never graduated. But I have to tell you, I did graduate, and my parents were able to come in 1999. Wow. I was... I was not going to be that family member. <laughs> you got your degree finally. 
I did. 1999, I was the oldest person walking in that line to get my degree. But, but I probably was, the proudest. I, I was definitely the proudest. Well, good, good for you for doing that. I think that's, yeah. you know, that's a wonderful goal to have achieved is to get your degree <laughs> like that. Um, so, all right, let's talk about the work that you do. You clearly specialize in musicals and singing in general. Um, what is it about musicals that has always attracted you? What is it about the musical theater that it speaks to you? Well, I guess it's the storytelling aspect of it. You know, it's, uh, again, that to me was always the foundation, the core of of music for me. It was telling a story and having this fantastic uh, soundtrack behind it, you know, which was the music part of it. Um, uh, with musicals, I get to be, um, I get to be somebody else mm -hmm. and explore somebody else. I, I'm sure this isn't new information for anyone, you know, about why people are attracted to musicals, but it, it is that you get to tell stories that are different from you um, and, and explore other personalities. I, I think it's important for the listeners to understand from guest after guest after guest um, why it is that they, you and others, go into this thing called theater in the first place and musicals. You clearly have a voice. You could have done, um, you could have been a, a recording artist and nothing else mm -hmm. and had a nice career and, and so on. We're back to that word career. But, right. but you could have just been a singer if you chose to, but you chose to go into musical theater, which is a specific discipline. And so I think it's important for people to understand why you do that as opposed to this other thing that you could have done, or you could have just gone into acting, period. Right. Well, you know, there is also a communal thing, a community uh, with a musical that I really love. Mm -hmm. I love the joint effort of telling a story. I love sharing that time on stage with other people. There's such um, a great feeling of we're in this together, even if it's for just those two and a half hours and you hardly ever speak to anybody else, you know, speak to any of the other cast members beyond those two and a half hours. Right. It, it, there is that sense of we're sharing something special right now that these people in the audience are going to be able to react to uh, whether they like it or not, you know, listen, if you're sitting in an audience, you're there because you want to experience, you want to try to experience something. And sometimes in, in it communal, works in a communal way, like you right, say. Right, right. And sometimes you hit it right on the nose. And other times, you know, the audience is staring at you wondering why they've <laughs> wasted this time and money to come see you. But you know, it, it really is that feeling of we we can share this together and try to tell this story. Mm -hmm. uh, the other part of it, which I, I'm sure you'll agree with, is uh, that it is the the special part about musicals are the songs which can go internal into a character's thoughts, where you usually can't do that with just pure dialogue unless someone right. expresses it, uh, and that that you get that gut punch from that music which is always if done well the music really can you know carries you to another place there, there's an interesting quote well it's not a quote it's just a, a what i remember of what they said and i think it was john candor who said it but i'm giving him credit perhaps it was <laughs> not john candor but someone who was a great songwriter said you the, the song is because words there there can be, you know, at, at this moment, all the words have been said and now it's just emotion. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's perfect. That words can, alone cannot express what a song can. Oh, no, no question. The, the music is um, something that is not really quantifiable intellectually. It's it's pure emotion. Right. Yeah. And I think that's what you're talking about. And the audience gets that from that pure emotion and it lifts them in a different way than just having dialogue. Right. 
is yeah. what a special thing that is. It, it, I mean, it truly is. How crazy is that? That something that is, you know, little notes on a piece of paper can have that kind of effect on on a, a large group of people. And, and imagine the uh, the amalgam of different elements that go into that moment from the musicians to the performers to the oh. lights and costumes to all of it this this thing that comes together to make one very compelling um emotional moment which is really magic you know the 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 time that was that really hit that home to me was doing a, was doing mamma mia and this was when we started rehearsal is when 911 happened oh wow and, uh, you know, you think, oh, my God, it, this is going to be this piece of fluff that it's a well-constructed piece of fluff, but no it's question. a piece of fluff. Yep. And this piece of fluff is we're going to open after 9-11. Oh. It felt like, oh, my God, you know, the, it just felt so wrong were you at going the into rehearsal literally as 9 11 was happening we actually had had maybe about five days of rehearsal oh my goodness and uh i i was on my way to rehearsal when we lived at that time on 14th street uh which faced oh. um nine you know faced uh, the world trade, trade center. center and i was coming out of the subway i mean it was a particularly New York morning for me because I was I had just come from therapy was on my way to the gym before I went to <laughs> rehearsal could not could I be more self involved so I came out of I came out of the subway and all these people were just standing immobilized and being the New Yorker I am I thought why are you people in my way <laughs> get out of the way <laughs> I have things to do and then I turned and faced south and where, saw where, were you where were you were you uptown at that point I was at Union Square okay so I was 14th and and 5th got it I was coming out of the subway right there about ready to go to the gym which was um uh, you know, a block away and then head on up to rehearsal, which sure. was at 19th and Broadway. So I was at 14th. So I was all, everything was going to happen in that area. And um, I looked south and saw all of the, the burning of the, of the building. The smoke. The smoke. And you don't, you know, I, I, I thought I, I, you just, stationary watching it your, your feet are not moving you're not sure what to do and you're watching all of these you're seeing you're part of this group now that is just immobilized i tried calling my husband and he wasn't he was on the phone okay this is really amazing but it, he was on the phone with a, a florist up state new york because it was his mom's birthday hadn't looked out the window <laughs> and this woman says to Paul, uh, you live in Manhattan? He goes, yeah. And she said, oh, my God, the World Trade Center, we've just been attacked. And he turned to look out the window and again, you know, saw, saw that smoke and the burning. And I stood there and watched for a few minutes until that first building went down. And uh, then I went home. Can course rehearsal was canceled. Um, but the point, you know, we started rehearsal, we got into it, you, you know, you become uh, a part of that group. And that was so important for so many of us in that, that we had that group to hold on to mm -hmm. during, you know, the time that New York was, was just, uh, hurt suffering vulnerable um stronger than it ever been and kinder than it had ever been mm -hmm. to each other when they decided to open i will never forget steve that first performance because we all thought we're not sure what this is gonna you know how this is gonna be but okay we're gonna you know throw it we're gonna throw that spaghetti against the wall and see see what happens sure the energy in that room was so I, I it was so overwhelming I, I get chills thinking about it because 
we were just doing our jobs. We were just trying to tell this frivolous story, you know, and sing our music and be involved in it. And we all loved each other and wanted to do this. What came back at us at the end of the show was this amazing amount of energy. It was like this whoosh wow. of energy from the audience because they just wanted a moment where they were not thinking about what was going on outside of mm -hmm. the theater. Mm -hmm. And that's when I thought, whatever I think about certain shows, whatever I think about what I do, that's the reason for it, that we could all just forget for a short period of time what was going on outside in the world. Well, the the arts in general, theater in particular, but the arts in general bring people to to perspectives that are useful in times of, of when we're hurting. Yeah. And, and, and I think there was a community feeling in that audience sure. of no matter who was sitting next to you or, you know, whatever, whoever these, whoever the people were, the strangers that were in the theater with you, somehow, like you say, we were all one at all that one. moment. Sure, absolutely. That's, that is an awesome story. That, that, um, but you lived down there. How did you, were you able to go home at that time? Well, it, right below 14th Street is where they blocked everything off. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so it was, we were pretty lucky that, um, but it was, it was a hard time. But like I said, it was, we all, it brought New Yorkers together in a way that, um, unfortunately, you know, we, we forget between those times that. Yeah. Uh, we're all in this together. You had one other huge advantage doing Mamma Mia, and that was that you had very popular songs that people already knew prior to them coming into the theater. Absolutely. Big advantage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they didn't have to really think too hard right. about these songs. And, you know, it, it, Mamma Mia is, is not a taxing or political statement. Right. It's, you know, it was just... It's an entertainment. That's right. That's right. And uh, you see the good for that, you know, that that it had its purpose right at that moment. It, I think entertainment always has a purpose. Yeah, I think <laughs> so, too. I, that's how I look at it. All right. So let's talk about the process that you go through. Um, when you begin to work on a role, you're, you've, you've been cast in something and, and you begin to work on a role, aside from the obvious, which is to read the script, you need to know what's there. Um, what is your approach? What's the first thing that you do to develop a character? What do you start looking at? Um, uh, usually I'll, I'll, you know, go with first instincts on who I, I think this person is. And usually uh, try to whittle away at that. My first instincts sometimes are the good ones, but there's always a lot more that's deeper mm -hmm. and looking at their relationships with each other. I think that's how you get to know who the person is, is do, you see their relationships with the other. Do you characters. start to see that prior to your getting into a rehearsal room with people? Is that something you work on prior to, or do you need to wait until you have those other humans? No, you know, I think for me, there everybody's got their own way of working on this. And some people really rely upon those relationships that they form. Um, that's what I mean. It's it, it's for me, it's chipping away at my first instincts because I'll go before I even get into a rehearsal, I've already created I, I do an awful lot of uh, the creating in my mind mm -hmm. before I get into a rehearsal room and then let the, the, um, the instincts, let, let the, everybody else bringing stuff. I, I, I have to think through all of that. Uh, I'm not, uh, um, I'm not somebody who is an instinctual actor. Right, uh, an instinctive actor. Uh, there are a lot of people who wait till they're in a, a rehearsal room, like you say, and then create. I I'm better if I create first, and then so that I feel like I have something to bring to the party initially. So you present something to the to the party, as you say, yeah. and then the party starts to work with you to mold you. 
Right, right. And and that way, uh, I feel um, it becomes for me, I'm comfortable with the entire process, as opposed to feeling um, like I'm being controlled by what's going on around me, at least I'm bringing something to the game I before a, I begin I have, it. I have a sneaky hunch that uh, the people, the other people involved, the director, the other actors, they appreciate that. that Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But, you know, this is how you learn who are the directors that um, are people you want to continue working with. Of, co of course, that's very, very useful. Uh, are you a researcher? Do you do a lot of research on character prior to uh, standing them up? I would like to tell you that I am, but I'm not necessarily. You know, it depends if it's uh, if it's. Um, this, the musicals that I've done haven't necessarily required huge amounts of 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 uh, character, you know, like a, a historical background. But you know, say when I did Gypsy, yes, I tried to read all of Gypsy Rose Lee's books and also look at the historical background around that time and and for women and you know what the expectations of women in particular. Uh, were at that time, and that helps to to color, uh, you know, to create a, a role, to create that character. And then it gets to be, you know, then it has to be laid on who I am as a woman and as a person and, you know, as a, a however old I am and as a singer. It's, you, acting always used to seem to me that it was something outside of who I am. And it, it, after reading a couple of books about acting, you know, I, I feel it's really important to always learn, to try to keep learning mm -hmm. and keeping your eyes open. And after reading a couple of books about acting, because I, I did not study at, in college uh, to a huge extent, it kind of scared me because it seemed like everybody else was really great at it except for me. And, uh, you know, it seemed so intellectual and that was not, you know, it was very cerebral and intellectual. And that was not how I was approaching things. I was approaching from a very um, emotional standpoint, from a gut feeling. Um, and so when I started to feel more confident about what I was doing, I um, uh, read a couple of books and to learning that basically it's finding those those uh, emotions in you that can relate to the character help you get a hook on it. Mm -hmm. And that was really very freeing for me because I thought, hey, okay, I can understand that. It's not outside of me. It's finding that combination in me that becomes this other person. Interesting, interesting. It what do you think is the most challenging aspect of developing a character for you? Is it the in the rehearsal process or is it prior to it? What, what's challenge? What's the most difficult thing or something perhaps that you always go through every time you go, oh, I've got to get past this thing, whatever this thing is. It's the, it's that questioning of, can I do it? Mm. You know, can I, that, that pulling between Karen, the Karen, the actor and this character is that, that, you know, I'm always, uh, trying to find that confidence to be that person. I see. That do, have I done enough to honor this character in you know, all her flaws and in all of, you know, her, her, uh, the beauty of a character, including the good, the bad, the ugly, have I done enough? There's always that moment I'm not good. I haven't reached it. I don't understand her. And then all of a sudden there's that one moment that's a hook that I go, oh, I'm, I'm, I feel like I can honor this character. You, you always have reached that every single oh. time you get to that point at some juncture. Where I'm going, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll never, I'll never reach it. And then something will happen that releases me to to feel comfortable to um, honor that character. I have a feeling that's fairly common for most folks 
I think it is. Yeah. I just don't think people talk about it enough that you think yours is, you know, you still feel yours is the, I'm the only one who goes through this because everybody else looks so confident. Well, that's the insecurity about talking about insecurity, (laughs) right? I mean, that's what it is. You know, I'm not going to tell people I don't know what I'm doing. I can't figure it out. (laughs) You're going to just say, hey, everything's fine. Everything's fine. Yeah, I got it. What do you mean? (laughs) Well, they they don't come to you, certainly not, you know, um, after you've been doing it for a while. They, They don't come to you because they don't think you can do it. They come right. to you because they expect you to do it. Right, right. So so that that by itself may be enough to drive some people crazy because if you're sitting there thinking, <laughs> I can't do this, but they think I can. <laughs> right, yeah. So <laughs> it's funny. It never, gets, it never gets easier or goes away, that questioning. And I guess that's a good thing because then you work harder. Uh, then you're always seeking. I think it's not only a good thing, I think it's requisite. I think if you go into it thinking I've got this licked and solved and you don't listen to anybody else, you have a problem. I do. Yeah. Yeah. I really yeah. Do. So uh, you must be a very good memorizer. Is that true? Uh, now, why would you say that? I'm <laughs> well, curious. <laughs> well, because I, I ask every actor what they do to memorize lines. Oh, yeah. I, here's what I do. I repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. And then I write it down because if I have it in my hand, mm-hmm. it gets to my brain better. Oh, that's, you know what? That's so good. I, I've been teaching people for a very long time that the typewriter or the computer or the keyboard does not help you remember things. Uh-uh. But if you write it down, there's some weird connection between your hand and your brain. Yeah, isn't that wild? Because if I if I write it down and then if I see it, that helps me. I can tell you where the lyric is when I'm doing. If I'm learning a song or learning something, I can tell you where the lyric is on the page uh, huh. because I I I I memorize. You know, it's like a photo. I wish I had a photographic memory, but I don't. It's a visual thing for you. You actually memorize it by by where it is in space. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of interesting. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that before. Oh, really? (laughs) Well, there's all kinds of different methods and techniques to to memorize things. I think it's important for the listeners to know that, you know, there is no one best way. There's what's best for you, and that's the way it should be. All right, so once you've opened a show and you're into a run for a while, because you've Mm -hmm. done long runs, you've done standing runs, what's the longest you've ever gone? More than a year? Well, I did sunset for three years, but I was not on stage all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, So the longest run, I it was actually Love Never Dies. I did a year and a half of that on tour. So, so once you've opened a show, what do you are you looking to to make the character grow in some way, or are you hoping to maintain? What is it that you're looking for during a long run? I know it's challenging. Yeah, it is. I'd say probably both, you know, all of the above, um, that you're trying to make sure that you don't forget what you've learned along the way, Mm -hmm. but also, um, uh, you know, you learn, you deepen things um, every, every performance because you relax with it. Although I did have a director once say um, that after, oh, gee, who was it who said this? I don't remember. But it, when we were doing and the world goes round and, and um, somebody said that the, that uh, said to the director, after six months is when you go back and remove all of the uh, improvements that the actors have made. <laughs> and you know, sometimes that's true. You're trying so hard to improve it and learn new things that you kind of forget that immediate, that that original story that you were all trying to tell. I think they were being very kind in saying that. They're, they're, I think what happens, and I, you correct me if, I'm, if you think I'm wrong, I think what happens is people get complacent a little bit because they're repeating so frequently mm. and they may even not even know they're being complacent and things get a little less tight. And I think 
I think that's what happened. Absolutely. And I, you know, going from there, I think because you've been saying it over and over and mm -hmm. over again, you get a confidence in the, the things that you're saying and your mind starts to wander into, mm -hmm. oh, let me invent this. Wait, I didn't recognize that, that, that she had said that. Oh my God, that's an integral part of my character. And <laughs> I didn't even know it for all this time. And so I'm going to switch this up and make this more interesting. Um, I have to say though, the good thing about touring is that there's always new things coming your way. And so- What, what do you mean? Well, because you're in a different city, we were doing weeks of, of, of touring. So we do a week in a city and then leave. We so do suddenly a week you're, in a you're city. going off stage, you're in a different place and there's, you're always right. trying to find your way and that kind of thing. Right. And the, the thing that is the stability is that being on stage with mm -hmm. each other mm -hmm. that doesn't change necessarily. It's everything around it. So you do, it, it does kind it does in many ways become again, that home for you, that those, that two and a half hours where you're, you, you get back to telling that original story that you were working on, um, with each other and, and every actor, so many things happen and go wrong. Um, you know, there were times where the set didn't arrive. Oh, Wow. Or pieces of the set didn't arrive. <laughs> and suddenly you're having to shift how you make your entrance. Mm -hmm. So that keeps you on your toes. You know, you're, you're never really allowed to get too complacent with things because who knows when do, that set might break. Do you, do you like that? Or is I do it actually. You, do. <laughs> you like it because it keeps you alive, doesn't it? That's right. It does. I love question marks. I, I love that not knowing what may or may not happen, mm. you know, having a little bit of having that stability, that that base of stability, but always just those those little things that are going to keep you like you say, keep you alive. Mm, that is that's terrific. I You know, that's it. I think that's what makes it keeps it fresh. Right. Right. In fact, do you have any special um, performance preparations that you go through every every performance? Is there something that you do? Is it a way that you warm up your voice in a particular way? Or do you have any habits that you you uh, always expo explore, or exploit, however it is? Yeah, there are a couple. Um, I, uh, I've learned to take a nap in the afternoon. My day, a show day is pretty much I wake up, have a big breakfast. I work out. I uh, do something for a couple of hours, very low key, very low key, not a lot of talking. I'm not known for being on the phone a great deal because <laughs> I'm always concerned. I'm not going to have a voice. And mm -hmm. that's my main focus is that show. That's what I'm pushing toward is that, you know, time, the show time. I um, take a nap. Then I have, no, I, I eat and then I take a nap around four o'clock me and the old people, the early bird special. <laughs> and <laughs> the blue and, plate special. <laughs> I, yeah, I saved a lot of money on the road. <laughs> and so then I take my nap, I wake up, I take a shower, I start vocalizing in the shower. I get to the theater. I like to get to the theater early. So I, I'm usually two hours before showtime. A lot of people <laughs> show up a half hour. I'm a two hour girl. I like to get there, get in my dressing room, relax, say hello to everybody, um, feel like I'm part of the company mm -hmm. and, you know, say hello and, and how was your day? Um, that's, and, rit that's ritualistic for you too. Yes, it is. Yeah. I like that part of it. I go in and say hello to this, the company manager and the, you know, and see what they're up to. And then at uh, the hour, I start putting on my makeup. And once I start putting on that makeup and getting my wig on, all of that leads me right to who that, you know, leads me to the, the, uh, the person I'm about ready to um, 
exposed to the world. Portray. Right. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And and my assumption is, is that ritual of yours has not never failed you. Uh, Yes. When I do it, um, you know, sometimes things don't allow you to do your ritual. And I have learned that that makes it more complicated for me. Mm. So I like to have, I like to lay out my day. Um, if you know, listen, I'm being paid and that's my job. Sure. And so my job then is to have my day lead to that time when I'm performing. And, and um, it would not be good if you were out of sorts or exhausted or something like that. Right. I don't, I, that just sets me back and it, I spend the entire show beating myself up and, you know, why did I do that? Why did I do that? And it just becomes a wasted amount of time. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. All right. So you, I, I want to talk about directors for a moment because it's an important part of your existence where you're always dealing with somebody who's giving you direction. And <laughs> I, I know you've worked with more than one. You've worked with any number of directors over time. Um, what would you say are the most important lessons you've taken away from working with your favorite directors? My favorite. Thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> as opposed well, to the ones who are the bad ones. Well, you, you will have taken lessons away from them too. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think that probably the uh, what I've learned from the best director, uh, and I I have to say <laughs> not very you know yeah I've not worked with. Um, The great directors are kind of hard to find. I hate to say that, you know, for me. And it is a personal thing. It is really a personal uh, uh, thing of how I like to work. The ones that I feel work with me the best, that get the best out of me, are the ones who communicate with me. And and what does that take? What does that mean? It means that you tell me what you're thinking about what I'm doing. Don't let it be a big freaking surprise to me when I find out you don't like what I'm doing. Talk to me. Trust me. Trust me as a collaborator. Don't make it that you are the director and I am, you know, so it becomes this, that we're not doing the same thing, that we have our job titles and they're not somehow connected. The, 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 the director who treats me as a collaborator is the one who's going to get the best job out of me. And usually the the ones that treat the company as collaborators, everybody loves them. Right. Right. Because you, you are a collaborator. I understand the director is the one coming in with the big overall picture, Mm -hmm. but I'm the one who's going to deliver, you know, part of that picture, not the whole thing, part of that picture. And when I'm treated as an intelligent collaborator, that's when I respond the best and will, um, and don't feel, you know, I feel the most confident in what I'm doing with them. So without, without naming names, you, you've clearly had some experiences with directors that weren't giving you what you needed or wanted. Mm-hmm. And how did you handle that? What, what's the way that you handle poor direction? Again, no names. Um, Oh, doggone. I can't give you names. I'm well, kidding. Well, if you want to, no, you can. No, <laughs> I still have a little bit more of a career left. I'd like to <laughs> not alienate anybody. Um, I, th- um, I, it took me a long time to not, f- to, it took me a very long time to speak up for myself. Uh, I, uh, it, you swallowed it. You would swallow it. I would swallow it and beat myself up over it. Mm -hmm. because I'd think I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. I don't have enough to offer. Why, why, you know, they're not, uh, uh, I'm just not doing a good enough job. You know, it was always my fault. Mm. And um, I learned during, um, during Wonderland, as a matter of fact, I learned to, um, stand up for myself and just go, I don't know why this is happening. I listen. And the director, I mean, all I have to do is look it up. It was Greg Boyd and Greg Boyd had a big, big, uh, thing on it. He had a big job on his plate. Sure. So I get that it was overwhelming and he's trying to figure out the, the puzzles 
the, the pieces of the puzzle. And I went to a rehearsal and suddenly my big song was being cut and I did not know why. And I went up to him and said this, it, after much crying, by the way, in my dressing room and my hotel room, mm. I, my husband said to me, get up and fight, get up and talk. Was this out of town or in New York? It was in Tampa. And so I went to him and I said, I don't know why this is happening. Can I help? Well, that's you a know? great line. That's a great way to ask that question. And it was, it was not, it was Paul who gave it to me, my husband. But that's a great approach is to, to put it back on, it's sort of on you and them at the same time. Right. And says, I'm not here to be angry. I'm here to let's solve this. Like you say, it's both of us together. As collaborators. And the answer was, we don't know how to, we don't know how to start it. And I thought, okay, I said, let me think about this. Are we talking about the Gazintas? Is that what uh, it was? The line couldn't get you into the no, song? No, no, no. They weren't sure how, to, how the song fit in, how to start the song. They were going to cut part of the song, and then they were going to cut. And I said, you know, I, I would prefer the, the song not be cut since it was my big number. Right. I would prefer it not go away because I sure. love it. And I worked very hard, you know, uh, on on uh, making it, you know, worked hard with the uh, music director to make it something special. Sure. And so it was about where it fit in the show and how to make it. It was kind of a, you know, they, they just didn't know how to fit it in the show. And so I, I went away and I came back with this idea. I said, okay, how about we do this? You know, blah, 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 blah. And he, <laughs> and Greg, to his credit, listened and then went, okay, let's give it a shot. Wow. Great. And it worked. And, um, so you instead, know, of, instead of them giving up on the song and then you also giving up on the song, you fought for it. Right. I fought for it. And that was a big lesson for me, not to let my ego get in the way of fighting for something that I believed uh, would work. Mm -hmm. that, that's phenomenal. I mean, and, and so that's, a, that's now an intrinsic part of the show. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so... All right. I want to talk about in between in your work life, mm -hmm. you, you clearly have had moments in your working years in which you weren't employed, where you were between <laughs> gigs. Right. And every performer with, I would think, extremely rare exceptions goes through that. What is it that you do when you're in between? How do you handle the, I'm, I've, I, I'm not employed, I need to find a job. How, what do you do with your life? Is it, is, how do you, is it physical? Is it going to the gym? Is it, how do you, what do you do? How do you work on your own stuff? Well, the in-between time, and you know, I think per, I would bet that, that there's the greater percentage, you know, the hugest percentage of people in show business have dealt with in-between times. And you do beat yourself up. And you do, if only I were better, I'd have work all the time. Mm -hmm. And you just try to, um, uh, uh, you spend most of your time looking for work. I mean, to be honest, it's, uh, if, you're, if you're lucky, you're always looking for work. Uh, you know, if you settle in a show and you're, you're in that show, even when you're doing a show, that show's not going to be forever. You're always looking for that next. Your your eyes and ears are always out, even when you're employed. Right. Always looking for that next thing. I am lucky that I have uh, a, a lot of different distractions, that I have <laughs> a, a cabaret career. Mm -hmm. I have recording. I, you know, I've, I've done a wide variety of things that doing demos for people, you know, I always feel like, um, if, if there's an in-between time, I try to fill it with something that will keep me, uh, occupied. And, uh, do, and do it does. Do 
you like the cabaret work? Is that fun? I love it. I love it. You know, I, I feel like I get the best of all worlds. I get to be, you know, the, the uh, center of attention mm -hmm. when I do cabaret mm -hmm. and have people, you know, pay attention to me for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and then I also get to be part of, uh, you know, a big communal thing when I do shows. And, and, you know, I, I, I love the, I love newness. I, I really do love it shows up in my life in so many crazy ways. I love, you know, shopping. I love the newness. I'm not good at going to a, a resale store. I want new. And so it's, it shows up in my, my creative, uh, world. I like to do I like the rehearsal part of it. I like working on new arrangements. I love doing demos for people because it's new music and it's just brand new. Um, doing a new show, uh, doing a, a show that you know somebody's got a new slant on. That's all very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and the in between time, you just try to not. Um, put on too much weight so you can fit in your pants to go to the uh, next audition, you know, and it's, it's uh, all about the pants. It's all about the pants. <laughs> COVID was not good for that. No, oh, believe me. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm doing my best to get rid of COVID stuff now. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah. Um, well, so, so, so you, in other words, uh, if I'm interpreting you correctly, it's all about staying busy and finding focus on things, both on the, the for lack of a word, Broadway style work, mm -hmm. and also in the cabaret world at the same time. Yeah, it's keeping the eye, your eye on, on uh, what you like to do, mm -hmm. and getting the chance to do it, you know, making sure you're ready when that chance comes along so that i go to listen i still study voice uh, you know i've been singing all these years and stuff happens that makes it difficult to sing the way you really want to sing whether it's getting older or something that happens you know a cold and then suddenly you're not able to sing the way you know you can or that that makes you feel good about it you know you try to just keep yourself as prepared as possible for the opportunity that will come along so that it's next an, opportunity. It's an on, ongoing a devotion to um, keeping your instrument, for lack of a better word, yeah. in shape. Right. It's always about, yes, keeping yourself uh, in, in shape is right. Well, that, that's amazing. Well, I've been speaking to the divine Karen Mason for almost an hour now, and we're going to head towards, head towards the, uh, the, the out cycle here. So I'm, I'm wondering, <laughs> you've, you've clearly uh, worked with lots of people for quite some time, um, and I, I'm sure you have been in some weird situations. Can you relate to us or share with us a story that's weird, quirky, oddball, or just plain funny? <laughs> Well, the pressure's always on when you say funny. So, um, it can be weird. It doesn't have to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, you know, that, listen, weird stuff always happens. Um, and f I mean, ridiculous stuff. That's the great thing about live performance. You never know what is going to happen. My first concert I ever did, it was my first solo concert in Chicago. And I had done, I had worked in, in nightclubs, in cabarets in Chicago for, you know, maybe, a, well, I guess about a year. And this was my first big concert at a place called the Park West. Um, we didn't know how many people were going to show up. We thought maybe 30, you know, if we were lucky. <laughs> and we were sold out with people uh, around the, around the, the, the block. Um, and I went to do my, uh, my encore, my, my, you know, we had gotten through the show. I hadn't screwed up anything. We were having a great time. I remembered all the lyrics and, um, I was going, heading into the encore. Things had gone great. And I had a, uh, a wireless mic. Right. And this is why I don't use wireless mics. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had a wireless mic and I'm going into 
the my my encore, which was make someone happy. Okay. So it's like, you know, Brian Lasser, who was at the piano, my music director at the time started playing, you know, the the vamp into the intro. People were quiet. There was such, you know, a feeling of joy in the room. And all of a sudden it's like, make someone happy. Make just one someone happy. <laughs> My eyes, were, I'm going, and I hear, <laughs> we were picking up radio signals oh, on the mic and oh the frequency my. of the microphone. Oh, dear. I mean, I if I wanted to call a cab at that very moment, <laughs> I could have. But that was, you just go, this is the best moment of my life. And this is what happens. And it's been and it's been slightly wrecked <laughs> <laughs> by a cab or a police car or something driving by and picking up on the on the radio mic. And how, what'd you do? Did you just keep going? Oh, sure. Actually, what I said was I had made a comment earlier about um, one of the nuns at my school, and because I try to like wrap it all up, I think I made some comment about that this was Mother Columba. You know, she didn't like something I had done earlier in the show, <laughs> and she was the principal of the school I went to. Uh, you you know, were saying it was divine intervention, <laughs> <laughs> or damning me to hell. I oh, wasn't sure which yeah. one it was. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, that kind of stuff, you just have to go with it. You have no other choice but to go with it. The show must go on. That's right. There's the mantra of all mantras, isn't it? <laughs> y you have to keep going at it. Well, that, that's very funny. I'm, and you survived, you know. I survived. I'm sure right. the audience loved you anyway. Well, actually, you know, what I've learned over the years is that those are the, usually the moments that uh, the audience is with you more than any other time during the show. Sure. Because they get to see something that no other audience has seen, you know, or will hopefully see. And, and which member of the audience has not had something screw up in their life? Exactly. And you become so human at that moment. So they empathize with you totally. Right. It's I, humiliating for you, but, you know, humanizing for everybody else. It, 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 exactly. All right. Last question today, Karen. Um, do you have a solid piece of, you've already given us lots of wonderful advice, but do you have a solid piece of advice or a tip for those who are either starting out and trying to break in, or maybe they're in a little bit, but trying to get to that next level? Um, you know, when I was thinking about this, every, every old person has loads of advice, but I, I think the, the thing that strikes me the most about people that I admire and, and um, what I, have learned throughout my career is to keep keep learning and don't let keep learning about yourself keep learning about the business but keep learning about yourself keep your eye open to how you respond to what's going on around you and how you can make yourself more open to what's going on around you keep learning 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 because in that you'll become more yourself and stronger. Um, and I think that's the greatest gift you can give yourself is to, to keep learning about yourself. And I think that's extremely valuable advice because if you don't, you suddenly go to sleep and you don't grow. Right. And, and you want to always uh, feel like every time you sing a song that it's the first time you're singing it and that you're open to what it's saying to you at that moment. Mm. And unless you're really, uh, you know, keenly aware of, of where you are in that moment in your life, some beautiful moments will slip by you. And, and, uh, I think that that would be a, a waste. Those are the most uh, valuable learning moments is when you're so aware of what's going on. Well, Karen Mason, this has been a just a tremendously fun hour on Storybeat today, and I cannot thank you enough for joining well, me on the show. Steve, it's been a pleasure. Are you kidding? An actor loves to talk about herself. <laughs> <laughs> I think, don't we all? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you again for coming uh, and joining me today. My pleasure.
And so we've come to the end of today's story beat. If you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great Story Beat episodes to you. Story Beat is available on all major podcast apps and platforms, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many others. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden. And may all your stories be unforgettable.